Hi, this is Ned Siegfried from Siegfried & Jensen. As proud sponsors of BeliefCast, we hope you are inspired by Todd's weekly podcasts, which contain so many courageous stories of recovery and personal growth. Remember, it's not what happened in the past that matters, it's what happens in the future. We invite you all to work hard and be optimistic about your future. Enjoy today's podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you once again for tuning in. I love you guys. Thank you for believing in me and for sharing these episodes with uh, your family and friends. We're trending now, and it just it blows my mind, and I, I can't thank you guys enough. And I also got to give a shout out to our sponsors, Wasatch Recovery, Siegfried & Jensen, uh, Living Recovery Interventions, Thread Wallet, and Veracity Networks. You guys, thank you for believing in me and helping me get this message out to the world. And I'd also like to thank my previous guests. Uh, uh, the reason why this is a success is because of the guests I have come on who are doing amazing things and they have amazing stories of overcoming stuff. And today's going to be no different. Today we are joined with the host of the Pretty Little Tribe podcast, international fertility coach, certified ICF life coach, speaker, mentor, the list goes on, uh, Elizabeth King. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Yeah, great. Well, why don't we start with you? You know, we're going to get at all these great things you're doing, but why don't we talk a little bit about your childhood? Tell us kind of how that went and how you were as a kid and kind of go from there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of a Pandora's box, I feel like, of how much <laughs> right. time we have. But um, I mean, overall, I feel like generally speaking, looking back, I had a beautiful childhood and I am one of four girls. I'm the youngest by seven years. So if anybody follows um, birth order, they know yeah. that, you know, part of that is your 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 own. Right. And um other part of it is I have a very beautiful relationship with my other three sisters yeah. and was very much taken care of by them. And um, <laughs> we're, we're still to this day, best friends, all of us. So I'm really That's grateful great. for that. I grew up in Orange County. Um, my parents are still around, thank God. Um, yeah. And, you know, childhood wasn't as easy as I had hoped it to be or how I'm now trying to prepare it for my own children going forward. It, I felt a lot of heaviness around our mm -hmm. home with um, my mom was chronically depressed, feeling safe in the world and, and what that means and, and what it means to feel so sad that you'd be willing to leave and, and or even say it out loud to yeah. somebody that you love so much. And so trying to um, comprehend uh, somebody who you know loves you, but at this telling you these things is really confusing as a child and as an adult. I know she really does love me. How is it that we can't find the right medicine or issues, I think, because of, you know, how things play out a little bit in that regard. Um, and sought therapy. I mean, I think my first therapist that I can remember was probably around... 10 or 11 years old, I think with my parents having the awareness of knowing that the home life wasn't a great place yeah. to be. Um, and so they were concerned and seeing issues with me just being depressed and whatnot. Um, and I remember thinking at that time that I wasn't really feeling connected with anybody that I was talking to and they didn't really quite get what was happening. Um, and that made me sad too because yeah. i wanted so badly to be heard and seen and to feel some relief and that i was you know people understood what i was going through but i they didn't um fast forward to yeah. my um early my late 20s early 30s i was married and then got divorced at age 30 and through that experience really of going through marriage therapy is when i became a life coach my okay. then husband said this feels like we're going through divorce therapy and i was like what are you talking about and he's like we go every week yeah. we don't get any tools to help us we're basically just talking about our problems and he felt like they were kind of not really encouraging us to stay married it was more of you know yeah okay, that's too bad. How do you, you know, so fast forward past that, 
coaching and life coaching was just kind of becoming a thing. People would joke, oh, you're from California, you eat sushi and you have a life coach. Um, (laughs) And now it's a much more common thing. Um, But in turn, that really did make me go towards that direction of helping people with like realistic tools that they could walk away to say, if I do this, this and this, it will shift um, whatever it is that I'm going through. And so I did that for quite a while. Um, and really the childhood experience shaped that. Yeah. You know, it's, as you're saying this to me, you know, one of the things I, 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 it's one of the thing I teach my clients as well, but I learned it as well is that I believe life happens for us. And as hard as those things you were going through, it kind of prepared you for doing all these great things you're doing today as hard as it was. And, and obviously when you're going through it, you don't necessarily see that, but it's really cool to see that you've taken these hardships and these things that you've gone through that were difficult. And now you're like, okay, what can I do to not only improve myself, but also maybe help other people along the way. And just having somebody point that out to shift that narrative in your head really does make a difference. And maybe you can't get your head around it at the time that you're going through it because it is the worst thing you could ever imagine. But you will, in hindsight, see that there is some sort of silver lining to whatever experience that that it is you're having. And I do think, I mean, in my day to day life, having conversations with people that I'm sitting next to at a restaurant, I can relate to them in different ways if they're talking about addiction or depression or whatever. Yeah, to a very deep level that it's, you know, it's about human connection and that's how i'm able to operate in the in my life is how can i find those deep human connections with people and those difficulties have led me to a very deep connection with people on their journeys whether that's from what i just spoke of or fertility now of what i really focus on yeah i know your mission is to help people of all backgrounds conceive a healthy baby carrying them to term and you're really passionate about that. And, and I know that uh, what maybe kind of got you in that direction is, was there something that happened to your sister when she was diagnosed with cancer? Yes. Um, so that was also a big life-changing moment. It was when I was 19, my, sis- my next sister next to me, who was seven years older, was diagnosed with a very rare cancer. It was a lung cancer cell in her cervix, which to this day, nobody on the planet is lived from who has had it and so we consider her our miracle but at that time it was you know the one thing she focused on was not being able to have children where we were like well you're gonna you know this is a death sentence basically like that's what we were focusing on but that was all she could think say was I didn't mean that I didn't want to have kids because she had only been married for six months. Mm. And, you know, when you're newly married, everyone's like, oh, when are you going to have children? And they would say, we're going to just have fur babies and, you know, (laughs) enjoy our our dogs. Um, And she's like, I didn't mean it. It was just basically what I was saying to get people to stop asking the question. And that was really the first intro into fertility. And, And in regards to how that might work with people who had medical issues, right? They had said, we'll keep your ovaries. Um, Back then, of course, this was now over 25 years ago. The the technology is much different. But yeah, yeah, that was, you know, my first thought was I'll have a baby for you. And we looked into it with the doctors of, you know, our DNA being from the same parents. And we kind of went through this really deep dive of education around this type of fertility at that time, which again, yeah. the technology is much different now than it was. A lot of uh, testing and things you need to go through in order to be able to carry a child for somebody else. And that is one of those things is being able to already have your own child before you can have one. I think especially oh. within the same family. I don't okay. know all the ins and outs of that now to date, but at the time that was it. Um, so yeah, that was the first intro to fertility for sure. Yeah. Well, you seem like a very driven person, um, and what you're doing and very passionate about what you do. You know, you have this, you know, did you, at that moment, were you like thinking, okay, what can I do to actually bring more awareness to this? And did you see yourself being this type of a coach? Absolutely not. <laughs> that did not cross my mind at all. I I, I knew that I had, a, again, an awareness that most people didn't, right? Mm-hmm. And this was a very young age. So I, I knew that I had this info in my head. How would you try to save these? And, you know, all that sort of stuff of the ins and outs of how the workings and whatnot. It wasn't until um, I was 
later in my 20s working in corporate America with women that were struggling to get pregnant then who were saying to me, you're so young, make sure you, mm -hmm. you know, check out your fertility situation and what your AMH is and all these acronyms that at the time were over <laughs> my head. I didn't know right. what they were talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but then when I got divorced at 30, that stuck in my head of, okay, I'm going to go check this out because yeah. not that I was a, was burning and yearning to have children, but more so what if, you know, I knew more than the yeah. average person. So I wanted to just get that information. And at that time, when I was 30, I went to a fertility doctor, actually the same one that my sister had consulted with years oh, prior. Really? Okay. Um, and he's one of the founding doctors that started at the NIH with IVF and all of that. So he's great. Um, and he said, you're too young at 30. Again, now, yeah. the technology then for freezing eggs was, was not great for the thaw. So he said, come back later. Um, hopefully you'll meet somebody and you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Well, at age 36, I was still single. So I knocked on his door again. He's like, okay, we'll, we'll do it for him because the technology on the thaw still wasn't great, but it was better than not doing anything at all. Yeah. So at age 36 on my own, I went through the IVF process and I froze, um, 11 eggs at that time. Oh, okay. So there again, furthering the education around fertility. And that's when I started to realize that I might start to use some of this information down the line. Again, knowing that I was life coaching, but really not focusing on that because even at that time, which was now 10, 11 years ago, the world of fertility was still not new because they've been doing it for many years, but yeah. wasn't as talked about as it is now for sure. So in that gathering of information and really soaking up as all as I could, I had a feeling somewhere that this would be on, on some sort of path, but I didn't know what that would even look like. There was no, no such thing as a fertility coach then or yeah. um, anything <laughs> of that nature. So, Wow. Well, I think that's so neat that you're now doing these things. You know, um, as you, as you were going through, I mean, you went through a divorce, did you feel, and this is more of a personal question, like how are you feeling as a person? I mean, yeah, you're going through all this, but were you feeling like, I don't know, like alone and lost at that time in your life? Because I know divorces, you know, people that I've interviewed, it feels like a death almost. Yeah, it was really difficult. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we were young, you know, and so, but <laughs> yeah. Even when you're young, you know that deep love. You know yeah. what that yeah. feels like. And um, and we really did love each other. And I think that was what was so difficult for me is it wasn't a situation where, you know, I hated him or he did something right. that I could never forgive or whatever. It was more of just realizing yeah. that where we, how we had gotten to that point, um, meaning we had been on, in a four year long distance relationship and at that time, there was no Skype or FaceTime or whatever. So long distance <laughs> yeah. really was, you know, if you're on a different continent, it was not easy of like, when are you going to be at a landline phone so I can call you? And that phone call is going to be $2 a minute, you know? <laughs> um, so it was very different times. And so once we finally did reach together four years later, there was, it was hard to rebuild that relationship. And I think we just both never got to that point. Yeah. But that being said, right? So yeah. Well, everybody's doing it. So, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but that, that took me a long time to heal my heart really from that. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. I know that's probably not the funnest thing to talk about, but uh -huh. you know, I know some of the topics that you, you know, you know, with your life coach and you talk about how to overcome stress, setting healthy boundaries, anxiety, depression, weight loss. And now you're, you know, obviously with your, you know, IVF coaching and all that stuff, what, I mean, this is a big question. I know it's a loaded question, but what are some of the best moments you have witnessed as being, you know, doing what you're doing with your coaching? Well, again, it is a loaded question because every like um, niche, so to speak, yeah. has its own beauty, right? Yeah. Um, and you probably know as well that there's, to me, the positive pregnancy tests or the ultrasound pictures that I get from clients when they find out they're pregnant, there's nothing better than that. Like, I oh my gosh, imagine. a life is yeah. created and it's coming to this <laughs> planet. That's amazing. Yeah. You literally can't wipe the smile off your face for, 
for days. Oh yeah. Um, so that's incredible. But then the also the turnarounds as well of you know being able to be on the other side of the phone to help somebody who's suicidal to get them to a hospital right. to know that you know and you get the messages of like thank you you saved my life because you answered the phone at 10 o'clock at night when yeah. I was calling you. Dang. So it's yeah. very different, you yeah. know, um, and then there's the weight loss type of things, which, you know, for a lot of people, it is really life changing. It might seem minimal compared to those other things I just mentioned, but that really shifts the way people show up in the world when they feel good about themselves and they can have that that change in narrative. So in each kind of lane, it's different, but it, in all ways, so beautiful in different ways. I love that. You know, you did a post recently um, this past week, uh, holiday weekend, and it, and it just says, reminder, be in the suck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, and I'm just going to read a little bit what you put. You said the world may feel heavy. Your fertility journey may feel heavy. Life may feel heavy. It's okay to take care of yourself, slow down and take a breath and, and to process. What, you know, obviously, you know, being a coach, and I understand this as well, you deal with a lot of heavy things, mm -hmm. a lot of emotional things. How do you, how do you just be in the suck? And not only are you helping so many people with what they're dealing with, but you have your own stuff too. So how do you, how do you be in the suck and how do you do that? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, I kind of have my pillars of my day of what I do to try to ground myself and okay. feel centered of, you know, what's my stuff versus what's somebody else's stuff? Because a yeah. lot of times when you are empathic or you're working with people that have a lot of heavy things going on, it's hard to tell. Like, am I feeling yeah. funky today because I'm feeling funky today? Or is it because, yeah. you know, I just heard some information that's not great or whatever it may be. So yeah. taking, and I've kind of feel like I've mastered that in some sense because I'm able to do it pretty quickly to tell if it's my yeah. stuff or somebody else's. But also at the same time, I do my, you know, 60 seconds of um, dancing by myself in the morning to sh <laughs> shift my energy. Yeah. Um, I try to connect with God in some way, whether that's mother nature or, you yeah. know, prayer, whatever it may be. Um, and those things in general, I really try to focus on not making it a point where it's um, not attainable for me because I am so yeah. busy. So that's why I say even 60 seconds for me shifts the energy and putting on good music and and yeah. really like literally changing the cellular makeup of my body by shifting it and dancing sort of thing. Um, so I think for me, that's how it is. It's and if it is my own stuff knowing what it is for me that does get me to shift it and also knowing when it's okay to still be in that suck. Right. So yeah. like, I think to my point about people ask about the divorce that you need to get over it so quickly, it's the same thing with yeah. if we're having a bad day, we're kind of expected to just get over it. Like we got things to do when there are some things that like, let's just be with that for a minute and realize like, no, we don't have to have a full pity party. But if you want to have a pity party for a couple minutes, by all means, you know, yeah. that's kind of a crappy thing that's going on right now. So you're allowed to feel the way you want to feel. Yeah. And I think society has made us, you know, a, I don't know what the right word is, but conditionalize us to a degree of feeling like it's not okay to be yeah. not okay. And right. I want people to know it is okay to not be okay. Yeah. I think where we get into a slippery slope is how long are you yes. in that state, right? For sure. Um, and realizing, okay, I've not been okay for a long time now. I need to seek help. I need to talk to a friend. I need to kind of get outside of where I'm at because yes, it's okay to be there, but it's not okay to stay there and it's not okay to have it affect your day-to-day -day life. No, I love that. It, you know, um, I love that, you know, you're, it's okay to not be okay but eventually you'll realize you're still okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, like to, I like to add that because you're right. Yeah. I mean, the, the goal is, yeah, you're going to, we're human. So we're not going to feel good all the time, but it's how long are we in that? And when it goes longer and longer, that's when we start suffering mentally and emotionally and spiritually and that kind of thing. And that's where I think your coaching kind of, kind of steps in and helps out. Right. Okay. Can, did you hear that last question or I did not. <laughs> that's okay. We'll laugh at it and we'll keep moving forward. Well, it's, you know, 
people who are struggling, like we said, you know, how long are you in that mode of where you just don't feel okay? And if it goes on long enough, it can be very detrimental to our mental health and our, our spirituality and that kind of thing. And so, um, so what do you do with someone who is kind of in that, they've been weeks and weeks into this feeling of, you know, not feeling well, what are some of the things that you do as a coach or, you know, guide them through to get out of that? Yeah. Well, that's, I think the tricky part that I work with, that's not always the case. And so we really work to find what is it for you specifically that works for you. And for some people, their form of meditation is cooking or baking. And, and, you know, if they can zone out on Pinterest and look up recipes or whatever, they (laughs) feel a lot better. Um, For other people, it's getting out in nature and connecting with nature in some way. So for what I found with my clients, it's really important to really hone in on what works for them specifically. And sometimes that might be trial and error. We would try things mm-hmm. for a week or two. And if that's not working, we try something else or every other day we do something different. Um, when you feel that expansion of your heart, when you're doing yeah. something, even if it's just a little bit versus a contraction, you know, you're on the right path. And sometimes when you're so far into that heavy, whatever it is, whether that's a relationship issue or fertility or yeah. death in the family or whatever, it's hard to find those moments of expansion. But if sometimes even if you hold your hand over your heart for a, a oh. minute or, or less and just sit with that, like drop into your heart for a second, you'll be able to get to, OK, where do I need to be right now? Is it a coloring book? Yeah. Is it meditation? Is it journaling? Is it, you know, maybe it's all of those things and it's different every day. But just oh. knowing that you have a toolbox, so to speak, to work from of what lights you up and what gets you to just take the next step forward is helpful because Sometimes when you're in that dark place, you just need to know how do I take a step forward yeah. and and having that toolbox and or the the numbers to call of friends or family or whoever, you know, to to be really honest with them of like, I'm struggling right now. Yeah. Help me get help me get out of here. Um, it it makes a difference if you know your t- like go to list when you're yeah. there rather than not knowing where to start. Yeah, I love it. Beautifully said. I love that. That's that's beautiful. So let's talk a little bit about your your podcast, the Pretty Little Tribe. Yes. Um, let's talk about why did you name it that first of all? <laughs> so I named it that initially mainly because it's this is the tribe of humans as a collective, right? Like mm, I feel yeah. like we are no one is together. And the idea of tribes have got, has gone back for, you know, millions yeah. of years and whatever way that that looks like. Right. And, um, and really knowing that you can always find that, that tribe, that collective, that whoever that can support you and you, you always will be supported. You're never alone on any journey on this planet. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned. And if you feel <laughs> like you are find me and I will connect you with somebody to, so that you know that you're not alone. Yeah. Um, and so that's really where the name came from. It was just, this is the tribe and we really focus a lot on fertility and, yeah. um, but we do talk to men and women about that. I mean, the, the male factor in fertility is really becoming, um, a topic of conversation and having more awareness around it as well. So as much as we focus more on women, I mean, there's yeah. honestly 50% of it is male as well. So, um, yeah. Well, I like that, you know, talking about the male and maybe what they're going through while this is happening to the woman and, and getting yeah. their perspective. I think that's great that you're actually bringing on, you know, kind of that, uh, perspective. I don't hear too much of that, honestly. Um, yeah. that's, that's pretty rare. Would you say at least right now it feels that way? Yeah. I mean, from two perspectives, one, I know from my husband, when we were going through it, how stressed he was, you know, yeah. and emotional he was, um, whether that was in the, during the miscarriages or, you know, just trying to conceive and having timed intercourse around ovulation. Like it was mm-hmm. really hard on our relationship. And most men are not having these conversations at work or right. you know, <laughs> out with their other friends, but really one in eight our couples are going through infertility. And so more so than you think a guy that you're hanging out with, if you're hanging out with guys, they're touched by this in some way, whether that's their own situation or their sister or somebody they know has gone through it. And maybe they're just not talking about it. 
So through the awareness of our own situation with my husband and like I said, our miscarriages and fertility struggles, I knew that that was a thing. Um, they just yeah. want us to be happy. Maybe they have low motility or um, s something with their sperm or yeah. no sperm at all. And, you know, that again is a very difficult conversation to have and to say that this is what's going on with you because we have this society that's very macho and you think that you yeah. know of course i can get somebody pregnant and right. there's nothing wrong with me and whatever and when that does come back to say there's something that you might need to check out here that's a big blow to the ego and it's also yeah. you know you have to work your way through that as not only on your own, but also with the relationship of how that works and 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 realizing that you're not alone. Again, just yeah. people aren't talking about it, but um, it's super, yeah. super common. Yeah. Well, I love that you focus a lot on connection. You know, um, in my line of work, we always say connections, the opposite of addiction, mm. because when we're in our addiction, we typically isolate and cut everyone off, or at least the healthy people in our lives. And so I love that you do a lot of that and making sure people are in there, you know, feel like they're involved with a tribe and that kind of thing. So I, I love that. Yeah, I feel like the currency right now in the world is connection. Yeah. And as much as, you know, we have inflation happening and whatever, I feel like if our inflation happens with connection on with people, we're going to be better off again as a collective of human race. Um, I love that. Connecting with our hearts rather than worried about everything else. Yeah. Well, so what is it? What does a day look like for you? Um, you know, you, you're coaching, you're doing all these things. You, you know, I'm sure you're very busy, but what does a day in a life look like for you? Well, I also <laughs> have three little boys, oh, yeah. which is, um, you know, changes the dynamic <laughs> of a lot of things. I, yeah. uh, my youngest is two and a half, three and a half and oh. five and a half. So, oh, wow. um, days start <laughs> very early at usually around 5 a.m. Yeah. And um, I try to get that grounding period before anybody gets up. My little one is usually around 530 to wake. So oh, once man. he gets up, then we're like, everybody <laughs> try to be as quiet as possible. So right. No one else wakes up. Right. God forbid. <laughs> yeah. Um, but usually the house is up and going by 6, 630. And for most people, it doesn't sound that early. But throughout the night, I feel like we're still not getting solid sleep. So, um, you you know, we're kind of waking up a little bit slow at these at these stages still. Um, so you know, the joy that comes from the the pure joy and energy that comes from these little guys that I have, again, yeah. coming from four girls, and now I have three boys is just yeah. mind blowing to me. <laughs> like, okay, what was what was God's plan with this? Because right. um, I'm not really sure what to do here, but I'm figuring it out as I go. Wow. But it really is, you know, f nurturing and, uh, and cultivating a different life for them than what I had and really mm -hmm. focusing on how do you feel about things and what can we do to uh, make that possibly can and know that we are super solid for them. And no matter what is going on with my life or my work or my husband's or whoever's coming and going, that they know that they are super solid together. Yeah. And, um, and knowing that my prayer for them is that they are best friends and that they know that they are here for each other and there's no one else that is going to be there for them as much as they can be for each other growing up so we kind of start our day and end our day we on all, the bathrooms we have um white chalk writing on there that i am amazing yeah. i am oh, extraordinary nice. um, my brothers are my best friends forever you know oh. all the the Love affirmation, that. so to speak, for their life. Yeah. And so we start and end our day with those. Um, and bringing that into the kids as well, we also do our gratitude time at the end of the day. And I think that really helps me to ground myself again from being a business owner and entrepreneur and all of those things and taking on other people's energy, sitting down and just having that gratitude. We pass around right. a crystal um, between nice the kids and my husband and I, and we talk about our highlights and our lowlights of the day and what we're grateful for. And that can be big or small, but I think that those are the things that with all the chaos in between of <laughs> um, all of that to, to end the day with that gratitude and, and knowing that we're showing up to serve people in whatever way that they need is basically how my day-to-day -day goes of 
How can I, how can I build connections and how can I serve somebody today? And that wow. might just be somebody via text or someone you meet at the store or at Starbucks yeah. or um, yeah. a podcast. Uh, <laughs> so lots of different ways, but ending the day too with that gratitude, I think is really, really great for me and my family. No, I, I love that. And I, again, it's another way for connection. You're connecting your family with each other. And, and I love how one of the affirmations are my brothers are my best friends forever. I mean, I, I love that you're cultivating that mindset and that, mm -hmm. that with uh, your, your boys uh, being that young, because at the end of the day, that's who we have as our family, right? Yes. And I, I for me, even before I had them, and that was one of what was so important for me for them and and i think the more that we talk about that and encourage that and and have them talk through whatever conflict they may have knowing that they always come together for that and nowadays family looks very different that could be yeah. you know your your neighbor or your best friend is your family or whatever <laughs> yeah. um so i also want to encourage that for them too that it doesn't necessarily need to be just them but at the but at the core knowing that that's what it is as well. Oh, I love that. Um, you know, I know, like we've said a few many times already in this podcast that you're, you're, you know, you do coaching and this and that, and you got your podcast and you speak and you do all these things. What are some of your future plans with all this? Do you have some things in the works that maybe you could share with us or like kind of what you want, where you see yourself maybe in five years with all of this? Me, I, as I mentioned, I have the Fertility Coach Academy where we coach other coaches to be fertility, specialize in fertility. And because we're, globally we've been at a six year decline and as I mentioned mm. before, one in eight is suffering from infertility, one in four is with a miscarriage that we know of. They think that that's very underreported. Um, okay. I see it as this domino effect of um, like waves, right? So that if I can help one person who's gonna then go help 10 people, et cetera, et cetera, then we've left a good footprint on the world. And I feel like that's really from, from the perspective that I come to now having had those losses and struggled with fertility is that the more that people can know that they're supported and they are not alone and they are not broken and they will get through this and we can help them get through this faster and less expensive and with more grace and more joy and just creating in the world because what we really are trying to do with fertility is create life. So how yeah. can we show up every day and create? And again, maybe that's creating from a coloring book or with Play-Doh or whatever that may be. So for me, the, the bigger picture is just helping to educate more and more people around fertility and the awareness that in, in school we weren't taught about just right. the basics of fertility. I mean, no less. So it just right. starting from there and knowing, you know, where to have people teach their children, et cetera, on that. So that's really my kind of bigger plan. And also to get yeah. corporations on board with realizing that so many of their employees are suffering from um, infertility. Yeah. And when they're in that journey, they're very uh, less productive than they would like to be. So having them have support that's offered as an, an open forum, as well as after miscarriage loss, knowing that they're really, truly grieving a death. So just oh. saying having the global awareness of all of those things is the, is the bigger plan for, okay. for what I have. Yeah. What I have <laughs> yeah. I think that's fantastic. You know, um, I, I always like to ask this question and, and sometimes it's, it might seem like a tough one, but what do you love most about you? That is a tough question. <laughs> um, I think my ability, I think my ability to connect and to okay. see that that love in everybody. I I, yeah. I can say that I sincerely get on the path with everybody that comes across my my desk, my DMs, whatever it may be. That yeah. I want it for them as much as it, they want it, and yeah. I'm in it with them as much as I can be, and it's really true sincerity when I say that I'm with you, I'm thinking of you, I'm praying yeah. for you, whatever it may be. And so I think the thing I like best about myself is that sincerity of connection that I'm able to build with people. Yeah. And I believe you because I can feel that sincerity in, in, in your words with me today. And uh, you can't fake that. And I can feel that from you. And so I think that's amazing what you're doing. And I love what you're doing. You know, you. I, if there's someone listening to your voice right now, who's maybe struggling, they're in a dark place. 
and they're just, you know, whether it's, you know, ha have anything to do with fertility or anything like that, or if it's something else, yeah. what could you tell that one person right now that's maybe in a dark place? Reach out to somebody. Don't stay, don't stay in your own thoughts because mm -hmm. you, you already know your own thoughts are not helping you right now. So at least have the, the foresight to reach out to somebody and I'm happy to be that person on, you know, at yeah. DMs or whatever it may be. But there's so much help for all different things that you're going through. And I know that feeling of being alone mm -hmm. feels so real. Yeah. But know that that thought in your head is not real. Yeah. You know, we have to try to decipher what is, in fact, the reality of what, you know, what can be fought in a court of law versus what have I made up in my mind about something that yeah. might not be completely true, right? And the power of our thoughts are incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, people are anorexic and lose weight because they the thought of being fat really yeah. controls that, you know? Yeah. So I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying that have somebody as an outsider to help you figure out what step do I need to take next in order to get myself back on track? Because you can. And it's just finding that person that you're aligned with. It may not be the one that's in front of you, but keep knocking on the doors until you yeah. find that person that you're like, that's my person that's going to yeah. get me to the next step. Um, because that person is out there. And that's why I feel like for even the people that are on the side of you and I, knowing that every voice matters, there's no such thing as the market being saturated in whatever area you're in, your voice is gonna matter to one person. And even if that's the one person that you can make a difference in their life, um, it is. So that's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, um, I think that's great advice. And you know, if someone does wanna reach out to you, Elizabeth, and, and learn more about your coaching and learn more about what you're doing and want to ask you a question, how, what would be the best way for them to do that? Elizabethking.com on my website, okay. um, my podcast, The Pretty Little Tribe, and or on Instagram at elizabethking underscore coaching. Okay. Yeah. And we'll, I'll put that in all the show notes and so they'll have links to all that so they can get to there as well. But uh, I do encourage anyone who may be struggling or has questions around everything that she does to reach out to Elizabeth and ask her. And, and, uh, obviously you, you love to connect people and help them. And so I'm sure she will. I mean, I reached out to you to be on here and I, I, I can't thank you enough for being willing to, to, you know, come on some stranger's podcast. <laughs> Happy to, happy to. Again, it's all about spreading that awareness and connection. Yeah. So yeah. I'm happy to thank you for the invite. Absolutely. If there's anything I can ever do for you, you let me know. I'd be happy to help you out in any way that I can. But uh, thank you for all that you do. And, you know, you know, best of luck and uh, positive energy in your direction for everything that you're doing. Same back at you. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, thank you. Well, there you go, folks. Elizabeth King, please reach out to her. And uh, if you have someone that's struggling with any of these things that she works with, please share this episode with them. And uh, they will be inspired by her words and obviously her passion and, again, her authenticity of wanting to connect. It's really, uh, it's really refreshing. So please reach out to her. I love you guys. Again, thanks to my sponsors for all that you do. And, Elizabeth, uh, it's been just fantastic to finally uh, sit down with you and have you on my show. Thank you. All right. Till next time, everyone. Love you guys. <laughs>